Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you here today. Thank you so much for being here. We get to uh, continue our series called Built for This. Uh, we're taking a look at Colossians chapter 2. And before we really get into the, the message, I do just want to uh, just share uh, about a special guest that we have in the audience today. Uh, we have a friend visiting us all the way from Taiwan. Uh, uh, when Lindsay and I were youth pastors in Yakima, Washington, there was a foreign exchange student that was visiting for the year and became part of our youth ministry. And during that year, she didn't just uh, remain a part of our ministry. She became a part of the Ellathorpe family in some ways. And she is just so sweet. So we have been showing her the North Idaho life uh, over the last weekend. And she said yesterday, this is heaven. And we say, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So would you please just give a warm welcome to Emily as she's here? Woohoo! Yeah. So cool. Yeah, Colossians chapter 2. Let me give a little bit of a, a, of a brief background and context and share a little bit of the heart as to why we're going through this study. The book of Colossians. It was written by a guy that we know as the Apostle Paul. And Paul didn't have like this incredible start in his faith journey. In fact, we first learn of him as this persecutor of the faith. He was trying to destroy the church. He was overseeing the killing and imprisonment of Christians. And then in Acts chapter 9, he has this radical encounter with Jesus, and it altered the trajectory of his life forever. And he went on to be probably history's most influential missionary. His influence is still being felt to this day. We benefit from his influence. In fact, uh, about, or for sure, 13 of the New Testament books were written, were penned by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote this book, Colossians, while he was in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel. And he has this friend, this ministry partner, his name is Epaphras, and Epaphras was a part of planting this church in this town called Colossae, the Colossian church. And he visits Paul while he's in prison in Rome. And he gives this report of how the Colossian church is doing. And he had a lot of good things to say, two good things highlighted. Number one, he said, man, here's one thing you got to know about the Colossian church. Their faith is in Jesus. Here's another thing you got to know about the Colossian church. They love each other deeply. Now, how many know, it, man, if, if we got faith in Jesus and we're loving one another, we got a lot of things going right, right? If someone came to Lake City Church and then they went to their friends and gave a report of their experience and they said, here's what you got to know about Lake City. Their faith is in Jesus and they love one another. Whew, I would be stoked about that report. Right, we would really be doing something right. What's up, homie? Come on and preach the word. <laughs> Right? I would be stoked about that report. But all the news coming from Colossians, it wasn't great news. They, they, he, Epaphras had some things to share with Paul where they were kind of straying a little bit. And it really had its core in the idea of doctrine. They were really struggling in the area of doctrine. How many of you know, man, it, we, could, we could profess faith in Jesus. We can try our best to love one another. But if our doctrine is off, even just one degree, we're going to get off track really quickly. We need to have core, good, sound doctrine. Now, the doctrinal errors in the Colossian church really revolved around three things. Number one, they diminished the view of Jesus. They said Jesus might be good, but he's not necessarily God. They had Jewish traditionalists within the church that were trying to blend old covenant law with the new covenant reality of grace, being saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. They were trying to blend the law into that and kind of create this hybrid system where they would say, listen, salvation, if it was an equation, it would be Jesus plus you. How many of you know we bring nothing to the table when it comes to our salvation? They also had false teachers that were gaining influence within the church. 
where they were coming in and, and preaching this false doctrine where they were saying, well, Jesus might be a way, but he's not the way. Right, This false doctrine was creeping into the church. And so Paul, he hears all of this and he decides to pen a response. And if I could summarize the book of Colossians, if it was like the Mitch International Version of the Bible, the book of Colossians would be two words. You ready? This is what it would be. Grow up! <laughs> Grow up! Move to maturity. You've received faith. You've received salvation. Now continue in it. Move forward. Move into maturity. Grow up. Now I want to read two passages of Scripture here in Colossians. The first chunk of Scripture is going to be a portion of Paul's introductory thoughts. And then we're going to read the portion of scripture that we're anchoring our series in. The first is Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. And we're going to read through verse 14. It says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras. We were just talking about him a moment ago. Our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our own behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. How many of us could use some patience today? <laughs> Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying you've received salvation. Now continue in it. Move to maturity. Grow up. Now we move into Colossians chapter two, which is the portion of scripture we're anchoring this study in. It says, so then... Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. I'm excited for our youth pastor, Jared, to unpack that passage for you in a couple weeks. <laughs> Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Did you notice how these two passages, they reinforce one another? And there's some similar themes that are played out in this passage. Did you notice Paul's saying, you've received salvation, now move forward. Grow up, become mature. How many of you know 
that the decision to receive salvation and make Jesus the Lord of your life, that decision to become this fully devoted follower of Jesus, it is so crucial. It is so important. It is life-changing. It alters the trajectory of our life. But how many of you know that that's not the only step in our journey? That's an important step. That's a crucial step. But it's not the only step. This is why I said earlier, when we talk about being a disciple, we talk about being obedient to his truth and being transformed by his spirit and engaged on his mission. The goal of a disciple of Jesus is to become more like Jesus. The goal is to be transformed from the inside out, to have our very nature and character changed into the image of of Jesus. We make that decision to follow him and then we choose to follow him every day and that following produces change within our life. We've gotta grow up, we've gotta mature, we've gotta move forward, we've gotta grow. And in these two passages, Paul really lays out some markers of maturity. And these are really the the topics that we're gonna be talking through over the next few weeks. He, he says, man, what does maturity look like? It looks like being strong in the faith. Strong in the faith. If you missed last week's message, man, Pastor Andrew did a phenomenal job bringing that to life and helping us understand what it means to grow, to become strong in the faith. That's a mark of maturity. Here's another mark of maturity. Being thankful. Being people filled with gratitude. We're gonna talk about that today in a little bit. Maturity looks like living with discernment according to the word of God, the knowledge of God. That's why we talk about being a disciple means being obedient to his truth. Man, we make the word of God the rule of our life. We make the word of God the filter by which we establish priorities and values and make, making decisions. The word of God is the foundation. Maturity looks like personal holiness living a life worthy of the Lord, where we really structure our life in such a way that we are set apart from the pattern of this world. You know, I'm gonna talk about this in a few weeks, but you wanna know a really bad strategy for reaching the world for the gospel is trying to make the gospel look like the world. And we are called to be set apart. We are called to be different. We are called to be holy. It's a mark of maturity. And lastly, number five, finding fulfillment in Christ. When our deepest sense of satisfaction and peace and fulfillment comes in Christ, not the house we live in, not the car we drive, not the job we have, not not our friend circle, not the clothes that we wear, man, in Christ comes our deepest fulfillment. That's a marker of maturity to say, man, I am fulfilled in Christ. So that's what maturity looks like. And here's what I would say. This is kind of my heart. God desires a mature church. God desires a mature Lake City. What our nation needs is a mature body of Christ. What our community needs is a mature church. What Coeur d'Alene needs is a mature Lake City. And the reality is, is that the season that we're walking into will be a revealing season. Most of us claim to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And the validity of that claim will be tested in the coming months. What we truly place our hope and our trust and our faith in will be revealed in the coming months. The depth of our maturity will be revealed in the coming months as we walk through this cultural moment that we've started to walk into. All right, we're entering a contentious season. We're right in the middle of a contentious season and the heat is just gonna continue to get turned up as we approach election day and beyond. And that should really come as no surprise What, this is a contentious season? Yeah, it's an election year in America. (laughs) 
This is gonna be a hot season, church, and I pray that the fire of this hot season would reveal a mature church. Here's my prayer for us. So far as it depends on us at Lake City, I pray that people see and experience and interact with a mature body of Christ, amen? Can we be those people? Can we be those people of maturity? The world needs a mature church built for moments like this. Built for moments like this. And honestly, what an opportunity. I don't say any of that with this sense of like doom and gloom and dread. We have a, we have a sacred moment in front of us. We have a divine appointment. We have an opportunity. We can view this season as an opportunity to be uniquely and refreshingly and life-givingly different to the world around us. We have this opportunity to show the depth of our maturity to say, man, we are people of faith. We don't believe that our best days are behind us. We know that our best days are ahead of us. We could be people overflowing with thankfulness. We could be a holy people living with conviction and really flourishing in the blessings of God uh, as, a, as a testament to his goodness. We could find our fulfillment and our peace and our satisfaction in Christ and to do all of that with grace and truth, unswervingly holding to the hope that we profess to the world. And here's the deal. That type of witness is the type of witness that will open ears, open eyes, open hearts, open minds to receive the truth and the goodness and the blessing of the gospel. So many American Christians have relegated their influence to a vote. And the kingdom of God just calls us higher than that. Do we vote? Yeah. Do we have civil responsibility? Yes. But man, we have an opportunity to make a kingdom impact through our maturity in the Lord. Our maturity in the Lord. That's the kind of witness that could actually make a difference in our nation and in our world. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of those markers of maturity is thankfulness. Colossians 2, 7 says that we are called to be overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with thankfulness, not begrudgingly thankful, not insincerely grateful out of a sense of Christian duty, but truly, genuinely, sincerely thankful. Now, thankfulness is a big theme in the writings of Paul. If you look at the 13 books that he wrote in the New Testament, you'll see thankfulness come up over and over and over again. Because for Paul, what he was really getting at is that thankfulness is one of the litmus tests for spiritual health and maturity. For Paul, living with thankfulness and gratitude in our hearts was the correct response to what Jesus has done on our behalf. He said, man, when you get a firm picture of who Jesus is, what he's done, when you get an understanding of his grace, the correct response to that is gratitude, thankfulness, joy. And by contrast, a lack of gratitude, a lack of thankfulness often revealed a lack of health and spiritual maturity. Look at Romans 1.21. It says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Isn't it interesting how central thankfulness is to our spiritual health and maturity? Isn't it interesting that a lack of gratitude leads to futility and foolishness? Now, I, I, I get it. I get it. There is a lot to grumble about in our world today, right? The Ellithorps, we were off on vacation last week and we were at a spot where there was no Wi-Fi, no cell service. It was so good. <laughs> it, was ama it was amazing just how smooth the world ran when we were unaware of what was happening in the world. So we get out of our vacation spot 
And now, you know, I'm like scrolling and checking things out. And it's like, the world is burning. <laughs> We're gone for one week and the economy crashes and what's going on? You know, like, come on. Right? We, we see all these things in our nation and around the world. There, there's a lot of turmoil. There, there, there are wars and conflicts and civil unrest and, and you know, the elections and politics. And bleh, yeah, I just hate all of it, right? It's, I get it. I get it that there are a lot of things to grumble about right now. Here's the call for us. Is that we have to cultivate an attitude of gratitude right in the midst of all of that. That's a unique witness to the world for a follower of Jesus, to be unflinchingly aware of everything that's going on and still be overflowing with thankfulness. In a sincere way, in a genuine way. And here's why I think this is so important. When we lose our anchoring sense of thankfulness in the fullness and the sufficiency of Jesus and what he has done for us, we will be easily enticed by pseudo saviors offering quick fixes for our earthly problems. Code for that is vote for me, I'll solve all your issues. Man, we gotta keep our eyes locked on Jesus, church. Because it's in him and through him that we will find our deepest sense of fulfillment and gratitude and thankfulness. We are called to be overflowing with thankfulness, a thankfulness that exists regardless of the circumstances we face. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances. That's convicting for me. I don't know if it is for you. I would much rather it say, give thanks in the good circumstances, because that's functionally how I live most of the time, <laughs> right? Stub my toe, it's like, this day is ruined, <laughs> you know? No, it says, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. <sighs> how many of you know that doesn't come natural? So how do we cultivate that? How do we partner with the Lord and the work that he wants to do in our life to cultivate this gratefulness? Let me give you three ideas. We're gonna go back to Colossians chapter one because Paul really lays out the basis for our thankfulness. How can we become overflowing with thankfulness? What do we have to be grateful for in all circumstances? Number one, citizenship in the kingdom. Citizenship in the kingdom. Colossians 1, 12 through 13, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. God's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. Everything that we see and experience today will pass away like a mist, like a vapor, like a fleeting shadow, but the kingdom of God will remain forever. And when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, when we commit to follow him as fully devoted followers, then we become citizens of that kingdom. And our future and our destiny and our flourishing is tied to his kingdom, not any earthly kingdom. And what that means for us, the implications for that is that now we are called to live as temporary residents and foreigners in this early kingdom. We've been given this commission to live as ambassadors in this earthly kingdom, entrusted with accurately representing the principles and the values and the priorities of the kingdom of God as expressed in scripture. Our future and our destiny and our hope are tied to not this earthly kingdom, it's tied to an everlasting kingdom. And for that, we can always be thankful. I love how Hebrews 12 puts it. It says, we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. So let us be thankful. And the basis of our thanksgiving is first and foremost rooted in the reality that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Secondly, it's rooted in the reality of redemption. 
Colossians 1.14 tells us that in Christ we have redemption. Now that, that concept of redemption to the original Colossian audience would have been immediately understood as a payment of a ransom. In fact, that word, it literally means freedom obtained by the payment of a ransom. See, the reality is, is that the penalty of sin is death. And we have earned this death for ourselves through our sin, through the many ways that we fall short of God's standard of perfection and holiness. And Jesus said this in John chapter 8. He says, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. This is our natural state, to be enslaved to sin and in need of redemption. And this is exactly what Jesus did on our behalf. He redeemed us. He paid the penalty that we earned for ourselves. And for that reason, we could always be thankful. In every circumstance, we can look to the cross and be reminded that we have been redeemed. Number three, the basis for our thanksgiving is forgiveness. Colossians 1.14 says that we have forgiveness of sins through Christ. See, if we've turned to Jesus for salvation and received his forgiveness, here's what we need to understand and be reminded of. And I think someone needs to have an acute reminder of this this morning. His forgiveness is final. His forgiveness is final. Man, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your past looks like, what your present looks like, and certainly not what you think your future could look like. If you have turned to Jesus for salvation, his forgiveness is final. I love how the psalmist writes that he has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. How many of you know that's a long ways from the east to the west? We have a reason to be thankful for his forgiveness. So God desires a mature church. One marker of maturity is thankfulness. Thankfulness for the kingdom of God. Thankfulness for redemption. Thankfulness for forgiveness. And what I find interesting as we just kind of have these closing moments together is that the word for thankfulness in this passage is the word eucharistia in the Greek which if that sounds a little familiar, it's where we get the word Eucharist, which is a word commonly used to refer to communion. So even in the language that Paul uses to describe thankfulness, he's communicating this message of what the basis of our thankfulness is that is unshakable, that is true and consistent regardless of the circumstances. The kingdom of God redemption, and forgiveness. And it's for this reason I thought it would be appropriate for us to receive Eucharist or receive communion together. You receive those elements as you walk through the doors today. I'd encourage you to pull those out. And you could peel off that top layer and that will reveal the bread Let's just have a moment just in closing, just reflecting on these things. Lord, we're so grateful for your kingdom. We're grateful that we are citizens of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, an everlasting kingdom. We're grateful that our hope and our future and our flourishing are tied not to this earthly kingdom, but to yours. And we did absolutely nothing to earn that citizenship. Lord, you rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. And for that, we are thankful. Lord, we're thankful that we have been redeemed. Lord, that the penalty that we earn for ourselves, you paid it on our behalf through your death. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness that has covered all of our sins, all of our trespasses, all of our transgressions, 
all of this brought about through your death. And so it's in this moment that we remember your death on the cross and we remember it with this sense of sacred gratitude. So Lord, we hold this bread in our hands. We're grateful that you allowed your body to be nailed to that cross, that you suffered and you bled and you died and you received what we rightfully earn for ourselves. And we thank you for it, Lord. Let's receive the bread together. Lord, we remember the blood that was spilled so that we could be washed clean. Lord, the great pain that you endured so that we could be made whole. And Lord, we're so grateful that in this moment now, because of what you have done, Lord, when you look at us, you no longer see our sins. We stand perfect and blameless and without blemish before you. So Lord, we receive this cup and we do so with grateful hearts. Let's receive the cup. Lord, thank you for this sacred time that we've had together, just examining your word, considering its implications in our life. And Lord, here's our prayer. We don't want to just be hearers of the wor word. We want to be doers of the word. So Lord, I pray that you would help us, empower us by your Holy Spirit to be known as a people overflowing with thankfulness. In the halls of our home, in the halls of our workplace, in the streets of our city, May we be a mature reflection of who you are, overflowing with thankfulness, and that our thankfulness would be rooted in the reality of your kingdom, in the reality of redemption, in the reality of forgiveness. Lord, we love you. Oh, we are so grateful. We are a grateful people. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.